Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts. Check this out right there. That looks beautiful. Sam, I'm going to pa pass this off to you here. As you guys can tell, we're at Andrew's Custom Leather. We've got Sam here and Dom. What are you guys getting up to, Sam? Well, we're looking at how we do carving today. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time since I could do everything myself in this business. This is Dominic Whitaker. He's my good right arm. Between the two of us, we make most all the gear that you see. And Dom is our in-house artist. He does this incredibly beautiful and intricate carving, something I never had the patience to learn. And he's going to show you today all the inside secrets and methods. It's absolutely fascinating, and he's the man to show you. So first, like, just tell us a little bit more about yourself, Dom. Um, sure. Um, I uh, went to school mainly for art and graphic design. I've always had the creative knack to me. Uh, I picked up leather carving as a, as a hobby, actually, about seven, eight years ago at this point. A good buddy of mine who was a master carver up in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, would uh, uh, pseudo adopt me every couple summers in a row and to just train me a bit more and more and that's how I know what to do that's how I know how to do all this all right and how'd you wind up with this wild and crazy guy <laughs> uh, through a mutual friend of ours it was my last semester at college as I was getting my uh, my bachelor's and he had heard through the grapevine that I was looking for a job and I just happened to know this leather worker guy <laughs> who just moved into town you should go and give him a holler so yeah. I called him up I was immediately taken by the fact he sounds like Gandalf over the phone <laughs> and um, yeah I showed up I spoke to him for about two and a half hours from everything from the weather to how we both like guns and I was told hey I'll see you Monday so oh, here awesome. I am that was the interview Sam that was the interview it was a very free flowing interview <laughs> Awesome. So uh, Dom's going to take over from now on, and Sam's going to go make some holsters, and we'll have more videos with him coming up soon. All right, so it's all, it's all on you, Dom. No pressure. Yeah. First things first, how do you guys start off these projects, and how much of it does Sam do versus what you do? Uh, well, when it comes to uh, car uh, carved rigs, like cowboy rigs in particular, he cuts out the patterns because he knows the shelf pattern better than anyone else does. Um, he gets all the pieces and components that I'm going to need, then he throws it in my direction to do general assembly and then to start laying out and creating the patterns for the actual carving itself. The carving starts as just a very simple pencil drawing on regular printer paper. So we have everything from the, uh, the classic Sheridan style carving, which is considered a universal standard for cowboys and westerns, to a whole bunch of freeform stuff that I've done as well, from holster bands, from photos that people have sent me, to actual photos you can just pull online, print out, and then uh, what I do to actually make the pattern stand up, as you notice the shininess on all that, that's just regular packing tape that I sandwich the paper between, so it's water resistant. It doesn't need to necessarily be waterproof, just it's going to be plastered against wet leather and abuse, so it needs to have some manner of resilience to it. Okay. And our finished product is going to end up looking something like this, which we'll come back to you guys with, right? Yes. Okay, awesome. So the first step, once you've got your pattern... So after you have your pattern made and drawn and cut out to match the shape of the holster, is to then you just take little tiny bits of tape, and you just put it on the edges. Now this is just a small little sample piece, because to make a full rig could take anywhere from 5 to 7 to 8 to 10 hours, depending on how complex the pattern is. And so after you get tape on the outside, you have your holster, your, what will be your holster face, and you wet it down. Just get it nice and soaked. Then you line this up to where it fits on top of it as best as you can. Like I said, this is just an example. And then you wrap the tape down so it sticks to the back because the back of the holster doesn't need to look pretty because this gets glued under with the lining anyway. So. After it's taped and not going anywhere, you just take a regular old ballpoint pen. You then trace over the pattern that you drew with the ballpoint pen with a fair amount of pressure. And what that will do is transfer a very faint pattern from the pattern you drew on the paper onto the leather itself. 
Because when leather is wet, it's very plastic in nature. You can do an awful lot with it when it's wet. Okay, so it's just a really an outline going. And that's so that's the reason why you sealed your pattern? That's exactly okay. it. Okay. Because if the paper was exposed on uh, the back side, uh, it would just, you know, what happens when paper gets wet, it tends to fall apart. And yeah. This pattern I tend to reuse fairly often, so I went ahead and put tape on the front. But, like, on uh, this pattern... It was a one-time thing, so I just put tape on the back side where it was going to get wet. Mm -hmm. And so what I can do is just finish out this uh, flower here because the full pattern would take quite a bit of time just to show you what it looks like after it's been uh, transferred onto the wet leather. Yeah, and, and just for folks to know, we're going to jump through some of this because um, how many hours does it take? would it take for you to get to the finished product here, typically? Uh, the holster that you just saw, it would take, I think that one took me seven and a half, eight hours to go from beginning transfer to finished pro to finish product. Wow. Just okay. in the carving. Okay. So. And you don't need to be super precise or get all the lines in, just enough to where you have something to work with. Because the groove that you're essentially pressing into the leather is twofold. One, it is your pattern, it is your template, it is what the final result is going to look like. But second, when we get to actually carving it in, it gives you a tiny little trench almost that your swivel knife, a tool I'll introduce here in a minute, can more easily ride in, so that way you're staying inside the line, so to speak. And so, you can show what progress I have. You just gotta peel the tape off the back if you can actually get your fingernail underneath it. And you're left with oh wow, something like that. Okay. <laughs> so I'm yeah. gonna do a little bit more, just because, you know, as you can probably see, this already does take a while. Yeah. But it is one of those things, the more time you take in the laying out phase, the easier it is when you actually get to creating it. Okay, and I ask Sam this all the time. Like, for this particular process, is there an official tool or the, or the ballpoint pen? <laughs> <laughs> like, Sam always uh, goes to that. Is that what the official tool is? Or? Um, For how I learned carving, it's mm -hmm. my official tool. But I really don't think there is an official tool. I think there are about as many ways to carve as there are people who carve. Mm hmm so, okay. got a little bit more. Like I said, this was uh, a technique that was taught to me by my buddy up in the Carolinas. And he just found out it worked for him. Kind of like how Sam will cut out a pattern underneath uh, or on top of a piece of shag carpet. Mm -hmm. I don't know any other leather workers who do anything like that. And so this is... Yeah. I Like I said, don't know if this is the official method, but... Yeah. This is I the think this is works. the difference you see between the art and the craft, right? Right. No, it's not so much the the final product is like, how do I get there? Can I get there in a way which makes sense and actually can create a decent product? And so, like I said, I'm not going to probably do the whole transfer, just the upper half of it, just because I'm just mm -hmm. now finished with the first flower. Okay. So then you just peel the tape off. <clears throat> well, let's just get a look at that here. Okay, very cool. Yeah, I'm surprised that that, that grooves worked itself in that much. So that's just a combination of the wet leather and the pressure from the pen. Yeah. Doing that. Um, okay. You really couldn't do it on dry leather just because dry leather is very resistant to impressions like that. That's why with every type of carving or stamping or tooling that you do with leather, you do it when it's wet. So... Then to actually carve the leather, you keep it wet, and that's the big thing. You always want to keep your leather wet. And I typically put on a rubber, a rubber glove with the thumb and first two fingers cut out just to keep sweat from getting on the leather itself. And then you use the swivel knife. Okay, so um, what was this called again? This is called the swivel knife. Now, the swivel knife is defined by just having a short handle... Some manner of blade, it can either be a wedge point like this one, or a flat tip like this one. Okay, and where did this particular one come from? I see you got a case This one here. came from Tandy. This is a very, this is a pretty highfalutin and fancy one. Okay. Uh, typically, they're much more simple than this one. This was just a limited run of, like, out of so many hundreds or so. Oh, okay. But the reason it's called a swivel knife is the saddle that your finger rests in 
is okay. free spinning. Yes, let's see that one more time. I missed it. So. All right. Okay. And then what does this cost on average? So I know you said this was a special um, one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the cost of this one just because okay. this was a gift, but you can pick up a swivel knife from Tandy for, I, I want to say, under $15. Okay. Not too bad. Mm -mm. All right. And so after you get the weather let, or the leather wet, <laughs> I'm going to retry that. <laughs> Tongue twister. Yeah. So you just take this. You can feel free to rotate the piece. I typically have a lead weight to hold it down or just hold down with your offhand. Mm hmm. Then you just put it in, and then you just apply pressure and form a cut. Okay. Yeah, let's take another look at that. I'm trying to get it in yeah. position. Oh, okay. So I typically try to aim to get the blade about a third of the way into the surface of the leather. You obviously don't want to cut all the way through it, and you want to cut deep enough to where the shape will actually be well transferred. Okay, so you're just going through that slight groove that's already there. Correct. Okay. Like I said, if you need to, uh, if you need to hop out of the lines, for instance, like let's say you realized in your patterning you made a slight mistake, you can very easily go out of it. But the slight groove does provide you a bit of guidance, not just in the you know here is the line draw within it, mm -hmm. but a little bit of actual tangible tangible feedback as far as where the blade is. Now, something that is important, if you know, if you can look right there really close, I did not join those two lines. Oh, okay. As soon as you join the two lines that you've cut into the leather, you create a point of weakness to where the leather could actually peel up and tear off the face. Oh, okay. So you never join those? You don't. You try to avoid joining two lines at all cost. Okay. You can continue a line, but to meet a line end-to-end -end will typically result in a catastrophic failure of that face of the leather. Oh, okay. So, and is this actually removing the leather or the leather or just cutting it? Uh, this is just cutting it. Like chiseling into a chiseling into stone almost, but okay. without actually removing any of the stone does. This is you, know, you can kind of see how the blade, you know, it's just a wedge, so it cuts into leather and it kind of forces the two halves of the leather on either side of the cut apart and that's how you get your defined line. Oh, okay. And then after you're done carving it, you can use different sets of tools to play with that effect even more, so you can have depth, highlights, low lights, backgrounds, and all that. Oh, okay. I almost find this bit meditative. This is the kind of fine detail work that I absolutely adore. It yeah, drives. this is like almost using a different part of the mind, right? Yeah. The brain. Yeah, you know, like I said, I was uh, I went to school for fine art and graphic design, and a lot of that is just very meticulous attention to detail and doing the same thing over and over and over again in slightly different ways. Right. What school did you go to? Uh, Flagler College, right here in St. Augustine. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's how I originally got to St. Augustine, so. Okay. I really wasn't planning on staying until I found out that there was a leather shop that had just moved here, and I've been here ever since. Awesome. I typically try to, I, I enjoy using the uh, the angled heads a bit more, you can get more finer details, you can get tighter turns, at least to my experience. Okay. So the heads on this are um, interchangeable. Yes, uh, I can show right there. There is that little screw hole on the side, it can sec. be a different type of screw hole on any type of swivel knife, where you just loosen the screw, pull this out, you can throw in another blade, you can see the blade's flat there to reciprocate that screw, mm -hmm. and then you just tighten it back down again, and that entirely is de dependent on your preference. So yeah, the swivel knife is very adjustable. You There's also another screw hole uh, in the handle of it near where the saddle is, so you can adjust the length of the actual pivoting screw in the saddle itself to better accommodate your hand. Like, I have rather tight hands when I work, but uh, there are some people who enjoy having their finger more outstretched so you can move the saddle and adjust it. It's not a one-size-fit-all type thing. And so then you just keep following the pattern you set in until you get to a point where you can then go on to actually start stamping it. But the carving is the part which is probably the most detail-oriented. You can hide a lot of mistakes with the stamping. So, just for clarification, this part is stamping? Uh, this is carving. This is carving. Yeah, this okay, is stamping carving. is what we did first. Uh, stamping is going to be what we do with these tools. Oh, that's afterwards. what. Okay, so we're so, coming to that step, right? Yeah. Okay. We All will right. be getting to that step as soon as I finish the carving. Yeah, I feel like I'm getting a crash course 
which is pretty much what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. There's really no right or wrong way to do this. Just a couple techniques and a couple things that you should try to avoid. Like I said, uh, don't meet lines. You can continue a line. Um, it's also good to try to cut with your swivel knife uh, held upright. You can tilt it down like this, but try not to go side to side with it. Because okay. if you cut in at an angle, you're going to create basically a tear in the face of the leather. So. Okay, and then your finger needs to sit in on it like that. Yeah, so the fingers okay. in the saddle applies downward saddle. pressure. Okay. And then you use the rest of your hand and your thumb to rotate the blade to get finer curves and details. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I keep telling him he's famous. Yeah, someone just rolling up on Sam while we're doing the video. Don't worry about that, guys. Um, so, yeah, it's it's quite it's kind of funny. I will be basically leaning over and crawling over the table on the work surfaces to do this because I'm one of those people that likes to move myself as long as well with the object. Right. Which is really funny whenever we get guests and I'm like on the table like this and. <laughs> Uh, performance art, man. Absolutely, art. Yeah. yeah. We should sell tickets. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. We're at a good point to show what the carving wow. looks like okay. when you get the carving done. Yeah. Try to give the folks out there a good view of what's going on here. And I was pretty fortunate to get that done with just one uh, sponge soak, mm -hmm. but typically you just... Your the leather needs to look leather. like that constantly. Yeah. But, yeah, so after we get it all carved, that's when we move on to the stamping. And the stamping is the part that I enjoy most. Okay. Because that's the more meticulous detail, and you use a wide variety of different tools to create whatever you want, really. Right. So before we go over there, we're going to change locations a little bit to do the stamping. So these are the stamping tools. Yes. So, I mean, what are we looking at here? Um, if someone was jumping into this... Do they just buy this all as a set? It looks like maybe it's two sets, but I could be completely yeah. wrong, right? Um, so. Well, this is uh, Sam's set of tools that he's collected, and this is my set of tools. Mm -hmm. uh, you can buy pre-made sets from like amateur uh, amateur kits, or you can buy individual tools. The prices mm -hmm. will vary greatly depending on the maker, um, the type of tool. You know, something like this tiny little mule foot tool, you could probably pick up for about three dollars, but something mm -hmm. like. Uh, a basket weave tool, or one of my favorite tools, the tri weave. Mm -hmm. These could go for about twelve. A pop. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. So you have just a wide variety of different texture tools, pattern tools, backgrounding tools, uh, bevelers. Uh, typically, when we think beveler in the shop, we think of a little chisel thing that you use to round mm -hmm. the edges off. But a beveler in carving is a small wedge head. So, um, here, let me see if I can... Okay, bring it in here, because everything right here at the yeah. level of these is in focus. Okay. So, so. it's angled on one side, and mm -hmm. what that does is so uh, you would... I could show you just a little bit right here before I start really pounding on it. As you just seat the edge that's a bit more protruded down inside the line you carved, and you tap it. Oh, okay. So, the, the someone that's new to this and getting these tools, where do they start? Uh, Tandy would be the best place to get them, but as far as the tools you're going to need, the best tools to get are just bevelers. bevelers. They have okay. the uh, textured ones and the smooth ones. Okay. And you can do almost anything with any combination of these tools. Oh, okay. And as far as, also, as far as patterns go, another thing to get is uh, this book, which is just about Sheridan-style carving. Oh, okay. It has the basics of how do you do Sheridan, because it's almost a school in and of itself. Okay. And so this is so. Is that the style that we're doing this in? Yeah. Or? This okay. is this is definitely a Sheridan, a Sheridan inspired carving style. Okay. All right. Can we flip through that real yeah, quick and okay. just? And where can they get this from? Can you get this from Tandy also? Yes. Uh, I got all. We got most of our carving. Stuff okay. From so Tandy. this has some examples mm -hmm. in there. Okay. And these are created by masters of the style who invented Sheridan style carving. Really. Okay. So everything from laying out to different floral patterns. Uh, how to maintain your tools and equipment. Oh, okay. And then the different tools and what they do. Awesome. All right, so we're about to go over um, and do the stamping now. Let's do that. All right. So 
after you do the uh, the carving with the actual swivel knife to get your lines and your grooves and your patterns into the leather, that's when you start stamping the tools. And that's done with a variety of different actual stamping tools. Uh, they can be pattern tools, shape tools, different kinds of bevelers, pear shape tools. Uh, there's thousands of these things, all of different stripes and different effects and abilities. Um, before I start carving on this, just to give you an overview of what a lot of the different types of tools are, I'm just going to do a bit of stamping into a random piece of scrap. So, uh, big, very important thing, always make sure your leather is wet. That's part of the reason why I switch gloves to this hand, because this hand is going to be on the leather's face and you don't want sweat on the leather. So, you have everything from basket tools, basket weave tools, which create a pattern which you line up and strike. And that's how you get basket weave. It is tedious, very time consuming, and rather annoying to try to get all lined up, but the end result is something that is really graceful and elegant looking. Uh, then you have other types of uh, pattern tools like the tri weave, which is one of my personal favorites. Where I'm just gonna be slow and show that to the camera as well. Oh, that's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Yep. Tip of deal. Okay. Then you have the more classic beveler tools, which are these chisel points, which we showed over on the carving table. They have a very simple job of just creating well, a shadow and depth into something, and they just go in, do light taps after you get the first ones hit. And they have those that are smooth and textured as well. And then you have backgrounding or texture tools, which they're a wide variety. One of my favorites is the pebble tool. This one's just a weird amalgamation of shapes. Which you just kind of whack and rotate while you're hitting it. Okay, so that's almost like a bark or frosted kind of, I don't know how to I believe it. this one's called the camouflage tool. Oh, okay. But, yeah, so this is what we use in backgrounds, just so that way you're not sitting there looking at a boring flat surface on what otherwise would be a very exciting and intricate piece. And so I'm going to put this aside and pull up the actual alter face that we were working on, get it nice and wet again. And so just before you were talking about sweat... Um, so I know people are going to get on me for this one. So the sweat is radically different, obviously, from just water, right? Yes. Yeah. What the does the sweat do to the leather? Sweat stains on leather um, are kind of like iron filings in leather as well. Both of them will turn the leather black. And not in a way that you can really overcome unless you're going to then go and dye it black. It's, it's something to desperately be avoided. Okay. Which, you know, being in the sunshine state is something we battle on the daily. And so then you just put the tip of the bevel tool, uh, it's a little wedge shape right there, into the line itself, and then you just do a light series of taps and you try to get that line as smooth as possible. And the more you do this, the more you'll learn you know, what lines you overlap, what lines you do on the bottom, what lines you bring to the surface, how hard to hit the leather depending on how thick it is, the grain of the leather. This is entirely based on feel and you have to gauge that as you as you go. I will say uh, the different types of leather that can be carved, um, to my knowledge veg tan leather or oak tan leather is the only leather which you can actually carve in this way. Uh, chrome tan leather, like the kind we use in our harnesses and you see in upholstery and other things like that is too soft and it just it won't hold carving to it. So then you just keep going around the shapes and the entire time you're trying to make it look like it was stamped in all at once as opposed to individual stamp marks. You know, the difference between this part up here and this part. So after you would do something like that, you would go back in and smooth it out with light little taps between. And you can probably now see why carving takes so long. Mm -hmm. Because that 
three and a half inches of mm -hmm. just the just the outer line work. And if you mess something up here, is there a way to, is there like an eraser? <laughs> I know this is a stupid question. Um, or do you have to start all over again? Let me grab something real quick. Okay. So, this is very simply known as a spoon. Simple little curve in leather. Like, let's say I were to accidentally pop out of the trench and boop, oh, I accidentally marked part of the leaf. Mm -hmm. It's not a perfect fix, but what you can do, let's wet the leather again. It's not a perfect fix, but what you can do is you can take a spoon and then very gently try to rub it out. You're actually yeah. compressing the leather down. You're not so much bringing the leather back up. You're compressing the rest of the leather down to hide your mistake. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. And we, we have a benefit of this leaf, which is eventually going to be a leaf, mm -hmm. uh, is going to get more carved and or more, uh, more stamping done to it. Mm -hmm. So that'll also hide it. But if you really want to get a line out, like let's say there's a, a crease like that. You mm -hmm. can just go in with the spoon and begin to work it out. Kind of fade it out a little. Yeah. Fade it out to where when you go back in to stamp it, it's going to completely disappear. Right. Okay. And so th I've been using a textured bevel tool now, which kind of lends itself to a, almost a shadow when it's all said and done. But for something smoother, like let's go to the uh, flower face itself, they have smooth be bevelers like this. So it's the chisel point, but almost to a mere finish. Where you would, uh, let's see, this, oh, I'll attack it in this direction. It creates something which is glassy smooth as opposed to rough and textured, like the, uh, the stippled bevelers. is. You can see a very f subtle difference between the two types of... Oh, okay, yeah. So, a lot of the stamping is just different levels of detail, which you stack and stack and stack until eventually you get something that looks like the, uh, the finish holster you saw at the beginning. And so, a rig like this where I'm doing a full rig, you know, the holster face, the belt, holster bands, that could take anywhere from, you know, the seven hours if it's a simple pattern, to 12, even 20 upwards hours. Depends on how much detail and how much of the face of the holster needs to be actually tooled on. Right, so if uh, two things. If people want to see the kind of work that you've done here, um, where can they go see that? And then also, um, how complicated of things have you done? Um, well, to answer the first question, we do have a, our, on our online catalog, we do have a, a few examples of different movie rigs that we've made. Um, I do have a social media. It is currently on a uh, private feed, but I'm, I'm going to be gearing it up to be more of a portfolio to see it, and that is uh, The Whitmaker okay. on Instagram. But as far as um, the most complicated rig, that would be a rig from a remake of the movie Shane we did. It was a little art house film made by a little art company for a very limited release, and we haven't even seen it. I don't even know if we can, but it was a remake of the Bad Guys rig. Now, the bad guy in that movie, uh, Palance, I think his name was, had this beautifully intricate, free-form, floral pattern that was a complete one-off. It didn't adhere to any sort of style rules at all. It wasn't Sheridan. It wasn't regular floral. It was this weird, veiny, just amalgamation of stuff that was not documented, and to make matters even worse, the original belt could not be found, and the only reference images were stills from the movie, which was made in 1953. So I had to try my best to reverse engineer a carving pattern which hadn't been made in more than 60 years. Hmm. And, and then you said the image really had no rhyme or reason to it? It was... Uh, no rhyme or reason, really. The only consistency to the pattern was that there was absolutely no consistency. Okay. I still have that paper pattern, too, so... Oh, okay. I can show you all that, just so mm -hmm. you can see exactly what can be made. Okay. Well, another thing that you may have noticed is the circle on the inside of the flower that I uh, originally marked out on the 
patterning portion of this, I have yet to actually carve. And the reason for that is, you know, there is a tool or a variety of tools you can use. Just flower centers. Different, t different patterns, different types that you just line up and give a good whack to. Oh, okay. And it saves you a lot of work and it creates a really nice pattern. And then you can go in with something like a spoon and then just blend it in. Yeah, the spoon is your friend for blending in already smooth uh, components of a carving job. Yeah, based on what you've already done, it really looks like a piece of wood to me. Yeah, it's it, leather is a very surprisingly plastic material. You get it wet, and you can do almost anything with it. Like I said earlier, a lot of it's just stacking subtleties and fine detail work. And then I would go back with the textured beveler, and then continue. Yeah, this is like Photoshop for leather, but your different tools that you would find digitally are these. Here, right. Basically. And there's my toolbar. Yeah. So. There's a lot of very light tapping noises for hours and hours and hours on end. Um... But uh, there are other, there are other variety of tools which I'll get into now called the pair tools. Now the pair tools they have textured ones, striped ones, and smooth ones, and these are fantastic for doing flower petals and leaves and other high points and low points where you want really nice defined swoops in the leather. So we're gonna get this wet again. And we're going to use the smooth pair just to plot out what these flower petals are going to look like. You have a fat end and a skinny end. So we're going to plant the fat end here and then just kind of walk it in as we tap the back. And we're going to do it next to itself again and next to itself over here. And it's with these tools you can start to come in at fancy and funky angles rather than just straight on. And you just keep following the marks that you make until you get something that looks somewhat organic. You can also see, just by doing that, we've hidden the mark in the nick that we made at the very beginning. And then you just keep going around. And a lot of this is to your own personal aesthetic. Um, like I said, there's the established style of Sheridan, but mm -hmm. a lot of it, you know, freeform floral is what I like to do a lot more than Sheridan. It gives me more flexibility, more uh, leeway to do things that I find more aesthetically pleasing. And it's not nearly as finicky. To my uh, to my tastes, at least. And then if you really want defined shapes, you can just sit there and absolutely hammer the back of the tool. And that gives really pronounced, distinctive lines and marks to the leather itself. So, is this like a painting where when you're looking at someone else's work or someone's looking at your work, can you tell who did it? Uh, in certain cases, yes, if you have a well-trained enough eye. Like, I can look at any work that my, uh, that, I'll call him my master, because he's the guy who taught me, uh, any of his work, and immediately know, this was made by him. Uh, others, not so much. But, again, that's just an eye you would develop for it. I haven't been, uh, like, in the community of leather workers all that much. Uh, mainly, my community is rather insular in here, but mm -hmm. there have been people who have been carving for a better part of their lifetimes, you know, 60 plus years so a lot of those guys are who wrote the book that I showed earlier as well oh, okay and so then you just keep adding to it to however much your heart fancies that's pretty cool thank you Yes, and then you have textured uh, teardrop or pair tools as well. But then for the inside of flower petals, I like this striped one. And so then you just pick whatever shapes you'd want. And you just do light taps at an angle. So have you done faces, animals, or things like that? Or is it a completely different style? That's not really in the Sheridan it style. It is a completely different style. I have done one 
uh, it's sculptural carving. I don't know if that's what it's actually called, but that's what I call it. Uh, there was a customer who wanted a, I think it was like a werewolf face or something. Like a snarling wolf face on the side of the monarch. And so I carved, based on an image he'd sent, I printed out the picture, covered it in tape, and it was a carving about this big that I, it was one of the most hyper-detailed things I've ever carved. Yeah. I wonder who that customer was. Shout out to that guy. Props. Please post something on social media and tag me. <laughs> the werewolf. That's awesome. So you can see it's very subtle detail, but the little lines inside the flower petals now. Especially when the light hits it. Yeah. Wow. And so then you just go through with the different beveling tools and different pattern tools, and you would continue this throughout the, you know, the holster face, to the holster bands, the belt, the billet. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do belt loops just because there's really no point to try to carve belt loops. With the amount of stress they go through, you would work out any stamping that you would do to them. Mm -hmm. But other than that, we can carve and tool every type of, every surface of a leather project, really. Awesome. And then, like you said, this can go anywhere from... Your, what's the minimum, usually, uh, hours-wise? The minimum, uh, the quickest, like, I'll call it floral pattern I've done, I was able to do just a holster face in about six hours. Wow, okay. Yeah, the longest was the Palance rig, I think, and that one took me the better part of 30 plus hours. Because <laughs> that was two holsters and the belt. And then they wanted a second one made in the exact same style, so I had to create an exact replica of the belt I had just done based on the pattern that was lost in mm -hmm. 1953 and mm -hmm. then make it exactly the same way again. Yeah. That's awesome. So, I mean, I know I, I don't know how you look at it. You could tell me. But it seems almost like you're creating heirlooms that are going to live long after you. Um, how does that, like, make you feel? I genuinely hope so. I, you know, I find great pleasure in the object being able to tell its own story, the history of the object living within it. Mm -hmm. You know, so the fact that I can create something that might have that type of reverence to somebody else down the line, like, you know, a hand-me-down from one generation to the next, that really does make me feel quite special. Yeah, you are, man. That's awesome. This is awesome work. So where do we go from here? Uh, so from here, uh, just to get things out, we're going to focus on these two leaves right here. So these we're going to be using crescent tools and mule's foot tools. Now, a mule's, a mule's foot tool are almost little V, little V shapes, little chisel shaped V shapes that have little teeth in them. And then the crescent tools variety, you have ones that are a smooth crescent with teeth in it, a stippled crescent with teeth in it, you have wider ones that look like little tiny sunrises, and you have smooth ones which create very harsh crescent shapes pounded in the leather. And so what I like to do is, uh, with part of the reason I enjoy doing my freeform floral more than the, uh, the established Sheridan, is I just like the flexibility Sheridan. You like clean lines, everything needs to be nice and pretty and very minimal in the actual veins of the, of the leaves themselves. I like just going ham and making it look as fancy and ornate as possible. So, grab our pear tool, flip it around to where it's comfortable to work in, and we do that. And then, and that right there is a good example of how you can get two very different marks just based on the angle you hold it. So, angle back so the fat end's in it, and then angle in so the smooth end, the skinny end is on the inside. Put that tool down, and then we're going to grab the smooth crescent tool, and just figure out exactly how you want to use it. And you can use the tip and stack it to where you get, <clears throat> excuse me, little um, veins like that. Or you can rotate it and tilt it this way and use the tip to get a completely different texture. And then you use mule, mule's foot tools to create little patterns like that. And then when it gets smaller, you can use a smaller mule's foot tool and continue to fade it out. And then for this leaf, we're going to use a different type of crescent. We're not going to use that one. We're going to use this one with the little teeth and the stipples in it. By flipping it around, 
planting the tip there and then just walking it back using more and more of the tool on the leaf itself as we go And then you can also use a variety of other tools, like these little tiny starburst tools, just to add little random details everywhere. Like, let's say we want something that looks like a berry or something right there. We just tap it. Hmm. And so I like going in with these tools every now and then just to put little random you know, little flower buds or berries or starbursts or whatever else you want to call them. Just wherever they fit. And then you would just continue something like this throughout the entirety of your project, and mm -hmm. that's essentially the base, the very basics of leather carving. Once you've done the carving, what's the next process in that holster? Uh, the next process for this after the face has been carved, because um, keep in mind, when this one has been carved, it has yet to be folded over or stitched, so this is the holster face, and the rest of the holster body is just laying flat out next to it. So I'm only carving about a third of the face of the, like a third of the actual surface of the holster. After that, this would get wet, bent over, glued with a, a welt down the middle here. You can kind of see the separation where the welt would go. Then it's stitched. Then after it's stitched, it's beveled and slicked. And then, you know, as most of the, as every other holster in the shop, it's beveled, slicked. Then it's dunked in the in the pot over there. The dummy is put in. It's pressed like that and then some very light molding on these is because you don't want to mold too much because the more you work with tools on the face of the holster the more detail you're going to work out of it and so after it's been uh, stitched molded pressed and formed then it goes to the finishing table and that's where this one is dyed black dom that was amazing Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, of course. Uh, now that we've got both of you here, for the folks that are watching this, uh, two things. One, if they want to order something like this, uh, what do costs look like? How do they actually get in touch with you guys to put in their order? Well, they should call us. But we do all of this on a quotation basis. Mm -hmm. Once we know the type of pattern they're looking for and the size, I can bring that to Dominic. He can look at it, get an idea of how long it will take, it can be, as he said, a wide range. Okay. No way to tell without actually putting it down on paper. Right, you got to call in. Okay, and then for the folks out there who want to um, get into this kind of thing, uh, either one of you could jump in on this. How do they do it? Where, where do they start? <laughs> if, if uh, honestly, um, like I said in the beginning, they do have like amateur uh, learn two kits at Tandy that'll have a couple of the very basic stamping tools. Uh, the most important things really is you know just to pick up good, just pick up the tools and start. Also, it's very important to have a hard surface to stamp on, because if you do it on a regular table, it's just gonna uh, eat up your table and catastrophic failure will ensue. <laughs> Absolute desperation. I have done it before, where I've just sat cross-legged on a on a concrete floor and just done it that way. But uh, Tandy does also sell uh, tiny chunks of marble that you could also carve on. So oh, cool. just have a good surface to work on and just get started. Yeah, I think Tandy is a good place to go for all this stuff, right? Great Tandy? place for beginners. Yeah, awesome. And then exactly how many years have you put into this so far to get to your level? As far as carving, um, I've I probably have to estimate because I don't remember. I started when I was a lot younger. It was probably about eight years just as yeah. a hobby. And yeah. then I've been working with Sam for almost three and a half. Yeah, now. three and a half. Three and a half. And, and I know you here. you do some carving, right, Sam? No, or you don't do no, that I, I do no. a little stamping, tooling. Okay. Carving takes patience I don't possess. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So um, for the folks out there who do want to put in an order, just give them the number that they need to go to. Sure. Go to 904-679-4997. They can see our catalog at andrewsleather.com. Got lots of great examples to look at there. Awesome. All right, so uh, do you know how I end my video, Sam? Uh, here, I'll coach you on this because we added some stuff, right? Oh, I see. They need to go to HankStrange.com, mm -hmm. you know, sign up for the email list. We are giving away some stuff, including from you. Right. Right? They need to thumbs up, subscribe, and ring the bell. 
So I don't know if you can remember all that. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you want to do there. And if there are other things you would like to see, please in the comments let us know. Techniques, methods, different operations. We'll be happy to look at it. Uh, we will bid you adieu. Thank you for spending this time with us. And peace out. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, we're out of here. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts.